thank you for coming today. Um, we have a wonderful all-women panel, um, which, you know, I always like to be a part of. So thank you for coming. Today we're going to talk about building characters um, and creating personalities and relationships in fiction. So a lot of the questions that I'll ask and I think a lot of what we'll talk about is related to um, the craft of writing and the actual process of writing, you know, as working writers. Um, so I would like to introduce today our wonderful panelist. Um, first up, Katie Simpson-Smith uh, was born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, she's the author of the novels The Story of Land and Sea, a New York Times book review editor's choice and one of Vogue's best books of 2014, Free Men and the Everlasting, a New York Times best historical fiction book of 2020, uh, and We Have All Raised You, Motherhood in the South, 1750 to 1835. Her writing has also appeared in The Washington Post, The Paris Review, The Los Angeles Review of Books, the Oxford American, Granta, and elsewhere. She received a PhD in history from UNC Chapel Hill and an MFA from the Bennington Writer Seminars. And her fifth book, The Weeds, came out in 2023. So, very impressive. Uh, our, on the end here, we have Sheila Sundar. She is a, a professor of English and creative writing at the University of Mississippi. Um, Hadi Tadi also happens to be my alma mater. Uh, her writing has appeared in the Virginia Quarterly Review, the Massachusetts Review, the Three Penny Review, and elsewhere. She lives in New Orleans. Uh, she's a local with her husband and their three children. Habitations is her debut. Congratulations. Uh, and it comes out in April 2024. So make sure you go out and buy it. Uh, and then finally, we have Emma Klein in the middle. Uh, she is a writer from California. Um, she is the author of two novels and a short story collection. Her debut, The Girls, was a finalist for the John Leonard Award from the National Book Critics Circle, the Center for Fiction's first novel prize, and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. She is the winner of the Plimpton Prize, the Shirley Jackson Award, and the O. Henry Prize. Her stories have been published in The New Yorker, Tin House, Granta, The Paris Review, and of course more. Klein was named one of Granta's best of young American novelists and a Forbes 30 Under 30 in media. Her second novel, The Guest, came out in 2023. So uh, we have a very impressive slate of writers here, and all of their books have come out in the past year, and actually one of them is coming out very soon, so I'm really excited to talk to you all about your books. Um, so in terms of writing characters, to me, writer um, characters and perspective is, is the most difficult place and the most important place to start when you're writing a book, because like, what is a book without perspective, right? Like, it's literally how the story is told. Um, so, when you're beginning to write, where and with whom do you enter the story with? How do you decide that? Um, and, you know, when do you, you know, how do you approach that when you begin writing your books? This is for any three of you. <laughs> I'm happy to start. Um, the most recent book, The Weeds, was a little bit different from my other books uh, because I started with first-person voices. Um, and I'd love to talk more about like first-person versus third-person decisions. Um, but when I started writing, I have two narrators, both unnamed, one in the present day and one uh, in the mid-19th century. And when I started writing both of them, it was their voice that I heard first before I saw what they looked like or um, really had a sense of their personality at all. Um, I was just writing sentences from, from their mouths. Um, and so it was very interesting to kind of work backwards into what kind of person might be saying these things. Mm -hmm. um, and then it wasn't until sort of well into the novel that they became fully fleshed out characters for me. Um, and then I had to go back to the beginning and be like, oh, now that I know that this person has, you know, a dead mother and, you know, this kind of trauma and, like, loves to skateboard, then I can, you know, back in the information as, I, as it has come to me over the course of the writing process. That's really interesting. That it's like you're meeting your characters as you're writing them. Yeah, absolutely. And rather than having them fully formed in your head, and it's like it's kind of give and take where your, your characters are talking to you as you write them and you're talking to them and it's like this collaborative process. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. yeah, I'd say it's similar for me in that um, usually I'm feeling my way into a character by what the character is noticing mm. uh, and kind of just letting that consciousness loose and seeing, yeah, what in a room is drawing their attention or how are they narrating a scene and, and that 
yeah, somehow the character seems to form itself. I don't think I've ever started, started a project knowing who the narrator was, totally. Yeah, it is, it's a process. Um, when I started Habitations, I, I, I think I, I assumed at the onset of it that you start a book, when well, you start writing a book the way, where you start reading a book, which is page mm -hmm. one. <laughs> Turns out that that's, maybe for some people that works, but I started it with a short story and it was a contained story about, um, so my, my protagonist uh, has, an affair, she's, she's an academic and she has an affair with a fellow academic. And I had a sense of what, who they were and what their lives would be like, but, um, and the premise of it, I guess, was a little bit, it's a little bit salacious, it's a little bit fun, but if you put a character in that situation, you really have to understand um, who they are as people, like what their impulses are, what their demons are, um, why they would make the choices they make, the story that they lived, the, li the life that they lived before the novel even began. And so when I started with that, I think that story ended up still being quite a distance from who my character ended up being, but that was when I really cracked her, when I kind of understood that period in her life, and then I was able to go back and really, and write the novel with that sense of who she was. Yeah, that's, that's really, you, you un, had to understand her motivations. Yeah, and her backstory yeah. and her, yeah. Um, all, all three of you in your uh, most recent books have, I feel, very defined characters with clear motivations, um, and they have, you know, they, they have, they're distinct, unique people. I think, um, especially, I'm thinking about Alex in The Guest, and she has, you know, uh, she's a, a character who is thrust into a world that she's not familiar with and that she wants desperately to be a part of. And um, so I think there we have very clearly defined desires. Um, but, uh, you know, and then also like your characters are, it's interesting that they're kind of put, both of them, both of the female protagonists are, despite being years and years apart, decades apart, they're searching for something um, that there's like some void in their life that they're trying to fulfill, right? Um, and then you have a character who's displayed, like who's moved from one place to another. And so I feel like all of these characters have very clear desires and hopes and dreams, even if maybe they don't realize it themselves. Um, so, you know, what, when you, we talked a little bit about this already, but I'm interested to know more. When you meet these characters, are you, are they, are they completely their own people? Are, are you inspired by you know, observations in your own life, people in your own life? Um, or are they just completely made up? In your, I mean, and it could be a combination of both, right? Like, I, I know for myself, my characters are very much um, inspired by my family members, right? And Jasmine Ward talked last night in the opening, um, the opening event, how she writes from the people in her family and in her community. So I'm just wondering how how y'all engage with your characters in that way. I'll start again. Um, again, this book was a little bit different for me. I ordinarily I would say that almost I don't know 95% of my characters are kind of made up whole cloth. Um, I'm not someone who gets a lot of inspiration from people in my life, and maybe that's cowardice. Like I just <laughs> don't want to. It makes your life easier. Actually. It does make my life easier. <laughs> Um, also, it helps to write about people that are long dead. Um, <laughs> but for the first time, I was dealing with a contemporary narrator uh, who I decided would be from Jackson, Mississippi. Mm. Um, she was a graduate student. I had been a graduate student. She had sort of difficult experiences with her advisor. I have had some difficult experiences with advisors. Um, and I almost, before I knew it, she was becoming more and more like me. Um, <laughs> but like expressing the like id version of me. Like she was angry and she was like radical and she was saying these things that, like I never felt like I had an opportunity to say, certainly as a Southern woman. Um, and so for me, it was a way, like I, putting myself into that character was such a, I don't know, cathartic exercise. Um, but it, it's very vulnerable too, because then you're like, oh wait, people are gonna read this. Um, and often when we, when we draw characters from real life, we're nervous about people reading themselves into the characters. And usually people don't know um, or can't figure it out who they are. Um, and probably no one would really know that this was a kind of version of me, except that I have now told you. <laughs> so now I'm extra vulnerable. 
Well, you've, yeah, you've told everyone here. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I think similarly, um, my character, Alex, from my most recent book, uh, kind of came out of thinking about, okay, who would this person be who did the exact wrong thing <laughs> in every situation? <laughs> uh, like, when you're in a room and you can kind of, you know, my brain anyway, could tick to like, okay, what's the worst thing that could happen? What's the worst thing I could do? Which, of course, I never do. Um, but then, yeah, having this character who you would let mm. follow those impulses um, and self-destructively so. Uh, and then I think also it was about kind of creating a character that was maybe answering different questions than the character in my first novel. Mm. And maybe you've had that experience too, where it's like my first novel, uh, it was a character with a really well-defined backstory and you know, you were really dropped into their head and their life and all these elements. And then I really wanted to kind of think, okay, what would the opposite be? What if there was this character who had no backstory, who was kind of a blank slate, and how, how would you even go about sketching this character, like in, in absences, kind of, in what you're leaving out? Um, so yeah, it's almost like a personal puzzle. Can I ask which was more satisfying for you? Oh, I think that's just like different, different questions and you're at different points in your life. Yeah. But I think, um, yeah, it's like why you don't write the same book over and over or just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was something really fun about, okay, like not giving yourself the, um, the prop or the support of traditional backstory or, you know, there's going to be X trauma for this character and that's why they're acting this way but really thinking, okay, this character still needs to hopefully carry a reader through a 250-page novel. So, like, what what is the reader going to hook onto in this character? And it for me, it did turn out to kind of be like, what is this character going to notice? And how are we going to learn about who this person is by what they notice? Almost like it's a camera, hopefully, that, it, you know, we're sitting inside their their head, kind of looking at the world. That's really interesting to think about in, in terms of absences rather than filling it up with backstory because when you meet someone in real life, you don't get their backstory, right? You just, you have to figure out who they are based on what they're willing to give you, what you notice about them. And I think that um, you've kind of mirrored that in the way that you have structured the character introduction in the book. So that's really, really interesting. Yeah, I have to start pretty far from myself. And I, I don't think I, gi I give myself the freedom to imagine if I, if I can avoid it, you know, like if, yeah. or if, if there's, if there's any, any resemblance. So my character is born and raised in Chennai in South India, which is not a city I've ever lived in. It's a city where my parents were born and raised, where most of my family was born and raised, or raised at least. Um, but I really had to imagine the geography of her life and the cultural specifics of her life. Um, and so to say, so the, my, my quick answer is that my character bears no resemblance to me in, in her impulses, in her fears, in, uh, in her intellectual pursuits, really, or in the specifics of her intellectual pursuits. She's, she enters a field, sociology, that I had to st read up on in order to understand even what questions she was asking herself. But um, what I did find interesting was that when she moves to the States, she spends quite a few of her years in New Jersey where I did grow up. And again, she's still not me. I mean, she doesn't become me because she moves to a place that I've known more intimately. We can, you know, we don't, as people, we know that somebody living in the house next door to us, j just by virtue of proximity, is not someone whose life we understand in any intimate way. And so our characters are the same way. They can, they can look like us, they can sound like us, they can share a town with us, but we don't know them, really. Mm -hmm. um, they're not us. But I remember saying to my students um, a, a couple of months ago something that I, 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 I kind of got the sense that for some of them it was sort of was a comment that, that didn't make much sense, but it made a lot of sense to me, so I'll repeat it. But um, which is that I think sometimes when we're writing, you are, there's this, a song playing at a really low volume in your head, and you kind of have to quiet the world, and you have to listen to it, and you have to pick up on, on the notes, and you have to, you find yourself eventually humming along to it. And, um, and, I don't know if I fully believe it, but enough of me believes it to think, to, to think it bears, it, it's worth repeating that I found that when she got to a place that I, I understood, or when she got to a point in her life where I knew her pretty well, 
I sort of was able to hear her song. I knew where she was gonna go next. I knew what those rooms smelled like. I knew what those conversations sounded like. And so she didn't start off as me, but as I got to know her and she entered spaces that I could imagine, um, we kind of became each other a little bit more. Wow, that's really fascinating that both you and Katie were saying that the characters are normally not you, but as you wrote them, they became more and more kind of reflections of your feelings, emotions at the time. Um, I feel like I'm the opposite, right? I start at a place where I know, and then the more I write, the farther away I get from that mm. character. Um, and part of it is also, too, that there's this feeling of insecurity for me that, especially as a, a woman writer, that people will assume already that those characters are exact, uh, and as a writer of color, too, when I'm writing about um, Vietnamese-American immigrant experiences, that people will assume that it's one for one, this is an autobiographical novel. Um, as women writers yourself, do you feel that your work is received in a, in a certain way, especially writing female characters? I mean, you don't have to feel that. I, you don't have to, but I'm just wondering if, if you've had a similar experience. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe it's true for all writers, but definitely I was aware with this book. I mean, although, yeah, she's like a kind of amoral con artist. <laughs> <laughs> so like, oh my God, um, but I... <laughs> and it's just something in general I've tried to avoid lately. It's just like I, I don't like an author photo anymore on a book. Um, and I've managed to now like kind of no more, no more author photos on books just because I, I really value the separation between the author and the work. Um, even sometimes like coming to the end and then there's the about the author, it's like almost I don't want to know. It's like mm -hmm. I'm still in the dream, like, and then suddenly I have to like be dropped into the reality of, of the person who wrote it. So I think anything I can do to maintain that kind of imaginative space for the reader by distancing myself, uh, I would like to try to do. I think that's so smart because I think often people like flip to the back of the book. And, and almost inadvertently, that's the face that gets kind of glued onto the yeah. characters. And I remember for my first novel, um, I had a lot of pressure to have a smiling author photo. Yeah. And the one I really liked was like, serious Katie. <laughs> and my agent was like, no, we need you to smile because you're <gasps> young. And Stop. Like we, yes. And the last page of my book, I think, and in the case, the last chapter, basically like everyone is dead, everyone's dying. <laughs> um, and then it's like, <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't work. That doesn't make sense for the story. Um, but there's such a pressure from, from marketing, I think, especially yeah, for women. Definitely. That goes against the grain of what you're actually trying to accomplish intellectually in terms of a book project. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was aware. I mean, to the extent that you're aware of your character's gender, I mean, they sort of become people and then they, they sort of they, they occupy the cultural and gender spaces that they occupy. but. The, um, I was aware at certain points in drafting that I was writing a cultural world that was a step removed from my reader. Um, and, and, and hopefully, I mean, you, you hope that, that we, we all hope that people are reading books outside of the immediacy of our cultural experience. And, um, and so you have that in mind, but I, I, I know that I, there, there's a sense that I, I found myself trying to quiet that when readers read work outside of a world that they feel they have known and inhabited, then there's an anthropological curiosity with which they read. And that's, that's not a problem. I mean, we are all, you know, most curious people are kind of armchair anthropologists. And, and that's fine. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sure I have been too. But then you began a, begin asking yourself, at least I did, like, am I, am I inviting them in? Am I explaining enough? Am I... Um, Am I, am I letting them feel comfortable in this room that they might not have, um, where, where, where they might otherwise feel like an outsider? And so I find in, in writing women characters, writing women of color, writing immigrant women, it was less about what I wanted to say and more about quieting a certain anxiety because a novel is not a, a, a work of anthropology. Um, it's not, it's a story. And so I, I, it was more of, a, of, of an act of, of creative discipline where I, reminded myself, that's not my problem. And if I make that my problem, it ultimately is in 
it, it, it ultimately doesn't, doesn't serve a reader who does open it up wanting to follow a character through whatever journey she's going through. Yeah, so did you, how did you handle that then? Did you feel at the level of explanation, because you know, I, I think about this all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just a relationship between the characters, but you're creating a relationship with your audience as well, with your reader. And so how did you handle that? Did you, did you lean into creating the discomfort or did you feel like I'm just going, I'm, you know, there are places where I feel that I have to hold their hand? No, uh, well, I, I think one, one real shift for me came when a friend of mine, who is somebody I really trust with everything I write, said, you're spending a lot of time worrying about what your character thinks. And ultimately, we think we want to know what people think. And in some spaces, we are curious about people's thoughts. But actually, we read because we want to know what characters feel. Mm -hmm. And really, when you ask someone how they're doing and they tell you like, what they've been thinking about lately, like that, that's interesting, but you really want to know how somebody feels. I mean, that's who we are in the world. We are, we, and we're not, not to minimize our, our intellectual curiosity about people's intellectual lives, but books are so much about feeling. And so I, I, I did, when I, uh, when I let myself g not worry so much about, you know, this, here's a smart woman walking in all of these, um, walking in all these academic spaces. I have to make sure that everybody knows her politics, everybody knows her beliefs, everybody knows what she thinks about caste, class, race, uh, and gender. And, um, and, and that's true, and that comes through, I hope, in, in, in the novel. But more importantly, I paid really, really close attention. I was so, 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 like the proximity between my, my face and her emotional life was like, I was pressed <laughs> up against it. And that was when I stopped worrying, because once you do that, mm -hmm. the other concerns just disappear on their own. Like you don't have space for them. You don't have space to necessarily wonder is, so and so who buys this in Octavia going to be confused about what they're having for lunch? Because you can't right. do both. Yeah. No, I, and there's Google if you need it. There's Google. <laughs> That's true. No. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think one of my major issues as a, a writer in the taught in the school of show don't tell mm -hmm. is that my characters are often, I'm making them do things. They're, I'm constantly describing action. They're walking to the school, they're going to the grocery store, they're picking up the bag of sugar. And in, oftentimes in a revision, I'm taking that stuff out because it's so unnecessary. And I think often about something that um, the writer Brandon Taylor said in a Twitter rant once, uh, that the, what is really transporting and important about fiction is that is not us seeing the characters move around and place things and you know do things, drive their car, whatever. It's the unique, we're in the unique position to understand how they feel internally. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I always try to remind myself of that when I'm writing uh, my characters. Is there anything that y'all are specifically hoping to do with your characters? Like, I know that I'm always looking out for that when I'm writing a character. It's like, am I saying how they feel enough? And it seems that Sheila is doing that too. But uh, Katie, Emma, what, what are you, you trying to do when you, what are you concerned about when you're creating your characters? Yeah, um, gosh, I guess for me, it, and you kind of brought it up, uh, just whether it's gonna be first person or third person, just in what way can I most effectively drop the reader into this consciousness? Um, Interesting. And perspective kind of is how, I, I'm really obsessed with close third person <laughs> lately. Um, I, my first book was in first person, which is, uh, it's, I don't know, it's so raw everything's, you know, you're kind of laying everything out on the table. Um, and there are, of course, ways to play with that, but I kind of like close third for the ways that it allows the character to not know certain things about themselves or the reader to know, but the character to not know, or just playing with that, that space has been really interesting for me. Um, and kind of that's where I'm feeling the most comfortable and the most excited when I'm writing a character. Yeah. 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 First person's really hard. Because it's any, deceptively hard. any moment that you break from that character perspective, it becomes immediately obvious because you're supposed to be immersed in that first person. Um, I also am obsessed with close third because you can you can be with that character but also there's circumstantial or environmental things that you can see as the this kind of all-seeing narrator that, that the character necessarily might not be able to see. Um, but you mentioned something about perspective too. Yeah, I think I'm often concerned with am I 
conveying enough about a character. Yeah. Um, I'm not someone who describes characters, really. Uh, and I, I only um, figured this out when I started teaching, and students uh, would read my novel to suck up. And <laughs> <laughs> they would say, I don't, I don't know what your character looks like. Like, you don't describe her clothes or her hair, or, you know. Yeah. And, and like, you know, if, if I were your teacher, I would tell you we, we want more character description. Um, and that really got in my head. I was like, oh, gosh, like, am I not giving the reader the right handholds to, like, enter into this journey with me? Um, but the fact is, like, I don't know what they look like either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's I, this book. Oh, sorry. No, no. Um, there's this book called What We See When We Read by Peter Mendelssohn, who's an amazing novelist and book designer, mm -hmm. too. <laughs> but he talks about how, like, Anna Karenina, like the color of her eyes changes like four times over the course <laughs> of the book. And just like how actually most of us don't have a good sense of like what a character looks like. Yeah. So maybe I maybe it's more universal. Okay, that makes me feel so much yeah, better. Yeah, because I feel the same <laughs> way. Yeah. Like I can see like the rooms that they're in and like what yeah. they're doing, but but it's the more actual... of this amorphous blah. Yeah. It's like when you have dreams at night and yes. like yeah. things are happening exactly. that you were like kind of the puppeteer. Yeah. I wonder if it's because we're writing from, it's like when we're writing, it's from as if we're looking at the world from our own brain mm -hmm. and it's not, it's in that perspective, right? And so when we do that, we're not, we don't know what we, I don't know what I look like. Yeah. Like I see pictures of myself all the time and I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> what was I doing with my body? Like, you know what I mean? And I think that maybe, I mean, that's really interesting because anytime I try to describe a character, Physically, it feels disingenuous. Mm. Like, I shouldn't do this. Mm. I gotta erase this. Um, but I was very interested, actually, in how you, this is a question for you, Katie, how you created relationships and created characters through the actual structure of your novel. Because Weeds is very, um, it's very interestingly structured. It's not a traditional linear narrative. It is um, very much... Uh, it's it, it's going between two time periods, uh, and we switch perspective quite often. So how did you how did you deal with that when you were writing? Yeah, so it's in the structure of a botanical flora, which is a sort of compendium of all the species of plants growing in a certain location. Um, in this case, the Roman Colosseum. Um, and because the entries for each plant are quite short, each narrator gets like half a page to a page to to have a voice before it switches to the other narrator. Um, so what you lose is any kind of momentum. <laughs> um, if someone's like dying to figure out what happens next, they have to like wait in these sort of chunks, um, which is asking a lot of the reader. Mm -hmm. um, and so plot for me became kind of a secondary consideration as a result. Um, what was more interesting to me is thinking how you can um, give these little like tiny bursts of momentum behind each character based on the plant that they're in the act of describing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much about like close noticing uh, in that form rather than dramatic action, right? Um, which gets into feelings um, and also intellectual considerations. Uh, but it, it was a different way to kind of cohere a character from a lot of different mm -hmm. um, small moments rather than uh, have a kind of overarching vision going forward, I would say. Yeah. I felt like the tension happened in not, some, oftentimes I think tension is built in this kind of suspense, this action suspense, or we're waiting for something to happen. But because you, you were saying it's very episodic, we're moving from perspective to, pers from plant to plant, really, is what we're doing. Um, the tension comes from what we learn about why the character is in kind of emotional tumult. Mm. Like it, and you don't learn it all at once, right? Mm -hmm. You learn it through these snippets um, and these, these records. Mm -hmm. um, but where, where do y'all feel the tension between your characters comes from when you're, when you're creating relationships? Oh, um, I mean, I guess with the guest, the tension comes from the the narrator basically being a <laughs> manipulator and, <laughs> and lying, you know, constantly lying about who she is. And so that's automatically setting up a dynamic with pretty much everyone she comes across. But it was interesting to kind of think, okay, which, 
what character, what person would most activate different parts of her? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's going to be different, this young woman at a party um, of kind of moneyed elite in the Hamptons versus uh, her with, you know, the house manager who's employed by one of those party goers. Like, just kind of thinking about it like this crystal of character and, you know, which, which interactions are going to illuminate a different facet of Alex, the narrator. Yeah, I was tense the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> I think the tension comes from not knowing what she'll do, what social faux pas she'll make yeah. in certain spaces. And there's just, I don't know if y'all have this, but like secondhand embarrassment where you're just like, <laughs> oh, please don't do this. Yeah. <laughs> and I think um, the close third helps, uh, helps a character who might not know what she's gonna do next either. Like, it gives you that space where I think if it was first person, you know, she'd have yeah. to be more in touch with why she was doing things or just the things she was doing. Um, and I was thinking a lot about disassociation and how to, how to kind of write that. And close third really offers that, that sense of kind of floating above yourself, not really sure why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if there is much tension as much as, um, so my character, when she, she moves to the States, she's in her 20s, and so she's very myopic. Like everything, mm -hmm. she has a, there's a, there are a lot of initial impressions of people that she thinks will just be kind of background characters in her, in her life. And as she moves through, through, through her intellectual path, her academic path, her, um, her decades of her life, she finds that people she thought were just accessories end up playing a pretty significant role. Um, and so what I, f I don't, this is sort of tension adjacent, but I think it was more that she gets called out on these initial impressions mm -hmm. quite a bit. And um, in the way that I think, in, you know, ho hopefully for all of us, our lives call us out on a lot of our initial impressions of people and, and, and of I ideas. And so she goes back to a lot of those people and she goes back to a lot of those relationships and they change form, but they become fairly, fairly meaningful. So I, I found that what I, that not, again, not quite tension, but I wanted her to have second chances and I wanted people that she wrote off to have second chances. And I really, and that came, that, that felt pretty natural to me that when you really, when you really look at these people and you hold them and, and you examine them from all angles, these minor characters, they actually have their own stories. I mean, a novel could be written from their point of view too. Mm -hmm. And so I really enjoyed getting them back together in, in, in unexpected and sometimes more expected ways. Yeah, I think your book has a lot of tension. Um, and I think that you create it through environment mm -hmm. um, and circumstance. Like we have a character who is uh, moving from very far away from home, is in academia, is a single mother. Um, I mean, academia, I mean, just, I don't know if y'all are stressed by academia, but I am. Like that place by itself, you place someone immediately in that space and I think um, it's already tense just from the structure of it. Um, but yeah, I think that there's lots of, lots of ways to create tension. It's very interesting. Um, I don't know how I, I can't, I'm like, what, how do I do it? I don't know, just wild flailing, I suppose. Maybe I'm disassociating right now. The way you can move backwards through time in your yeah. book creates a sort of automatic like narrative tension because you're like, wait, we're yeah. going further and further into this space that becomes more and more unsettled as you go, I think. Well, I had a, I actually had a lot of the same what you were describing with the structure of your book. I I also came upon that same issue while I was writing in that, or not issue, but I had to let go of my expectations of what I thought tension might feel like, yes. or what I thought character development might look like because of the way that it was structured backwards. It every chapter you go back, it kind of cuts what you would think of traditionally as momentum. Um, and I think just like doing anything unconventional in structure, you just have to let go and let it happen. But um, <laughs> that I, I did a workshop the other day on weird, on things that ha like weird things that happen in reality and that Coke can sp <laughs> spraying everywhere. I'm gonna put that in a story later. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay, well, I guess we can do um, uh, quite, a final question, which is that, um, what is a favorite character that you've written 
um, or a future character that you're waiting to write. It can just be something quick or someone that you thought of in your life that you've always wanted to write. But I'm the, um, working on a new project that uh, looks at the life of a 17th century still life painter from Spain. I love this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he becomes a monk at some point in his artistic <laughs> journey. Um, but I, I'm really interested in how, like, aestheticism and aestheticism pair, like, the kind well, of, like, uh, I don't know, lushness of art with, like, the monastic self-denial, like, how those two things can coexist. Um, so I'm excited. So amazing. <laughs> I'd like to not follow that, so Emma, can you just... <laughs> Um, I wrote a story from the point of view of Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> also great. So, uh, Incredible. Which was like, yeah, a really um, interesting experience. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. Both of you. Uh, um, I, uh, I'm working on a project now that is about a diplomatic family, and it's from the perspective of a wife who kind of follows her husband's diplomatic career, and they're sorting through the politics of the of the aughts and um, and I'm interested in how I'm interested I'm always interested in the domestic and the political how we're interested in the world around us but we're also consumed by the dishes and the children and the and the the very um, the minutia the very emotional minutia of life while the world kind of happens in a very intense way around us so I'm looking forward to getting to know her better amazing I love the early aughts <laughs> <laughs> I mean the war was not good. Yeah. <laughs> but great to write about. Yeah. Um, so I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. If anyone has any, maybe time for two or three questions. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you all. Um, first of all, from an analytical mind, as opposed to a mind like I suspect it would be to write a book, creative, emotional, whichever. I'm fascinated in it all by what all four of you do. And so thank you for sharing. Um, my question is about the process. And I can't even imagine sitting down and deciding to write a book. So I'm wondering, is the process fun? Is it, <laughs> is it, is it even, Maybe therapeutic, or is it the opposite? Like it's anxiety producing because either you've found out that you shared something about yourself that you didn't really want to, or that you created a drama that is now haunting your life. So I'm curious as <laughs> which it is, if either. I'd say all of those. Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> Just like going to therapy can be both really fun and horrific. Yeah. I would say it's similar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a great question. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's fun in quotes. I don't yeah. know if any of you have seen the bear, but they, they ask the character, like, are you having fun? And he's like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know for us, it's such a joy when we can identify with one of your characters and just can't wait to get back to it. So whether you describe it well enough from your perspective, we do it in our own mind, and maybe that's... The point, anyway, yeah. is how we see that character. So, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. I have a, a comment and a question. Uh, I'm actually in the process of writing my first book, or you know, knock on wood, hopefully it gets. And I'm just starting the third act. Uh, and I really do feel that the characters, I have a little start of what they are at the beginning, but they start speaking to me and which way they want to go. Uh, but my question is, do you know where they end up, or do you? hey, I know the character of Alex is going to this going to have some stumbles or whatever, but I don't know where it's going to end. Or, hey, I know I want to get her to X spot. Then it's a puzzle. How do I get the character there? Yeah. Um, I guess for me with uh, the guest, I, I had an image in my head um, of the emotional tone that I wanted to end the book on. And it was mm -hmm. this, it, this kind of, also image of this woman kind of alone swimming in the ocean and knowing she can't go back to shore and like how long could she kind of just tread water so I, I didn't know how that that emotional quality would express itself like where she would actually find herself but I knew 
kind of the emotional register. But I, yeah, I think it's surprising. I don't know, what, what are your guys's? Yeah, I, I tend to never know where they're going until pretty late in the project. And I'm like, whoa. Uh, <laughs> either this means I have to completely revise the first three quarters of the book, or like, oh, I've actually been setting myself up really well for this ending. Um, yeah. I always have a sense that I want my characters to be OK. I, I like books that have some sort of a happy ending, and so mm -hmm. I, I like writing those. Um, but I think part of the, the novel, the process of writing for me is figuring out what okay looks like. And, that, and so figuring that out is also part of getting to know the character. What is, what is her resolution? Um, and then I try to, try to get there. Congratulations, that's exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, okay, this is a quick one. I just wanted to ask, in moments where you're crafting your characters, if you ever feel stuck with them, or if you're feeling like where they're going might be a little like uninteresting or dull maybe, what are some techniques or things that you do to make your characters more complex and interesting in those situations? Um, speaking of therapy, one of my favorite <laughs> writing prompts is to take a character to therapy. Um, so I'll start off on the page, they walk in, the therapist says, what brings you in today? And then the character just starts talking, and it's often not where I was expecting them to go. Um, and that's a really good way to sort of like allow myself to give them space to have their own yeah. thoughts and feelings. The Sopranos method. Yeah. <laughs> uh, for me, it's usually you know putting them at cross purposes with something or someone else. Um, I remember reading this thing that was like the cat sat on the mat. Like that's not a good story. The cat sat on the dog's mat. That's like a story. <laughs> and so I'm kind of looking for that in a scene, like who's the cat, who's the dog, what's the mat? Uh, yeah, and it can be little, little things, but just some little interruption. Yeah. I think going to their life before the story started and ask, give them something or take it away from them and see what, it tur what that turns them into. Mm. Amazing. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I think, we don't have any more time, but are, are we signing books after? Or? I think we're okay. signing books after, right? Yes, um, so you can ask the authors questions in, in the signing line, but thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for coming.